It's 15 years since I've been here. Um, I did Virtual Futures and then I left and I never came back. Never looked back, always looked forward. And this is extremely strange for me to find myself back at Warwick. Uh, such a very changed Warwick and furthermore to find myself at the resurrection of Virtual Futures. What I want to do today um, to introduce you to Virtual Futures is, well, basically I had two lectures. And one of them I think would get me sued, and one of them won't. And I'm going to give you the one that won't, but perhaps later in the bar we can have the more scandalous, uh, perhaps truer version. Um, what I want to do is uh, introduce you to a concept that um, is the result of the past 15 years of work, issuing from the project that Virtual Futures actually was grounded in. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about the original conferences. So. I want to begin our exploration of the future with a return to the deep past. I want to examine our visions of new Prometheuses with an image of the original Prometheus. I want to begin with a picture of a man making a thing. And here's the picture. The thing which the man is making is fire. He's using a tool one of the oldest tools known to man, the fire drill. In fact, Rouleau, the great historian of machines, considers the first machine, the Ur machine, to be the fire drill. The wood and stick device for creating fire. What's happening here is that the man is rubbing his hands backwards and forwards to rotate the stick so as to create friction at the point where Tinder is placed on the block underneath. This is the simplest way of using the fire drill. At some point in the past, however, the machine was refined. The hands were often replaced with a band or a twirled string around the fire drill. And sometimes this string was attached to both ends of a bowed piece of wood, though this is not essential and this is a diagram thereof. The twirled string replaces the action of the human hands. The hands move in similar alternation, but now at a greater spatial distance, holding the ends of the string rather than touching the stick itself. There is therefore an homology between the hands and the string. When one pulls the ends of the string to rotate the stick, the string twirls up and down the stick. Eventually, what will happen is that the string will cut an impression of its movement into the stick, leaving a spiral indentation. Rouleau proposes that this is where the idea for the threaded screw came from, the object emerging before its intended function, as it were. What is significant here, however, is that the string does not need to twirl. It's only because the string acts as an extension of the hands, homologous with them, that it acts in the same way as them, exerting a downwards force which is no longer necessary. The string could equally well, as those of you who have cars or tumble dryers know, be a fan belt. It could be a closed loop in a single groove. The form of the screw hence emerges from a function that is no longer proper to the fire drill, the need for the hands to exert downward pressure. Now, one could not deduce this solution, as it were, this emergent property, solely from an examination of string and stick, or hands and stick. But might one be able to deduce the prior existence of a fire drill if one only had a screw. We might well say that the emergence of the screw, when it was a new piece of technology, was a mere accident in the process of artifice, a chance event, a discovery, in fact, of a form that exists in nature, a single helix. After all, some plants take this form, whirlpools and tornadoes express it. DNA is famously famously has the structure of the double helix. But we might also observe, when we're looking at artifacts, 
that there's a chain of material influence, a network of relations of form linking the two artifacts. From one function, making fire, emerges a new technical form, the helix, which then suggests to the human mind a new function, the screw. If we imagine a future archaeologist examining our current day technologies, then we might start to see how often the devices and the artifacts we use every day are not necessarily novel human interventions, but the products of a non-human technological evolution. In fact, some archaeologists do look at modern day technological artifacts, even from very recent times. Though as they're mainly concerned with examining the, examining the artifacts of the dead in order to understand how the dead once lived, they are unconcerned with how technologies came into being. One of the concepts archaeologists use to explain the existence of certain otherwise inexplicable artifacts is called skeuomorphism. The term as it is presently used refers to a fashioning of artifacts in a form which is appropriate to another medium, and so to the migration of a form proper to the construction of an artifact in one material to a replica, a simulation of the same artifact constructed in another, usually less valuable material. We see instances of this process in pottery jugs from Zaire, as George Basala describes in his fantastic book, The Evolution of Technology, where the slight and non-functional handles high on the necks of pottery jugs are in fact survivals from handles made of cord. The clay jugs are themselves copies of more durable metal ones. And what happens is that archaeologists come across these clay jugs with these very delicate handles that uh, just don't seem to be functional. If you pick them up by the handle, it would just snap off. And they say, well, what is this doing here? How did it come into being? And infer from the existence and from the observation of m survivals of metalworking techniques the existence of an earlier, more valuable metal original. The utility of the concept in archaeology is that it allows for the identification of a function hidden behind what has become mere ornament in the process of transfer from one medium to another. Yet this definition of the concept includes only cultural artifacts and their static qualities. I'll leave that for a moment. The Oxford English Dictionary defines skeuomorphism as the use of one material to give the appearance of another. The etymology given is from the Greek skios, which means vessel or implement, plus morphe, form. The primary definition of a skeuomorph, and I'll quote the OED here, is an object or feature copying the design of a similar artifact in another material. Yet there's also a secondary definition, and this is it. An ornamental design resulting from the nature of the material used or the method of working it a process which the illustration demonstrates. Skewmorphs are, to describe them in another way, therefore, the memory capacity of non-organic artifacts. To study them is not just to study the objects themselves, but the unself-conscious processes and non-human agencies uh, that operate in the process of their production. I wish to suggest here that we shouldn't leave skewmorph, uh, skewmorphs to archaeologists but we should seek to identify them in all kinds of cultural activities. Because we live in an age of rapid skeuomorphic transitions, of shifts in materiality. In its ability to identify a transitional process between functional and aesthetic forms, skeuomorphism is a factor in the genesis of style. The style of man-made objects, certainly, but also the style of cultural life, the style of language, and the apparently ineffable style even of societies. If we therefore abstract from the concept of skeuomorphism a general principle, 
that where a function is rendered obsolete, its residual traces become ornament. We might observe that such a principle obtains very widely both in nature and culture. The human body is a catalog of skewmorphs. Hair, for example, no longer having the survival value that it did once for our ancestors, now serves a primarily ornamental role. Fingernails are painted, nipples are pierced. These practices, in their decorative aspect, also serve new cultural functions. Hair, for example, can serve as marker of tribal or religious allegiance, of descent or of conformity. Nails can serve to indicate gender and to distinguish social status. Not all such organic skewmorphs, of course, are generally visible. The vermiform appendix, the coccyx, the palmaris and subclavius muscles, and wisdom teeth, but none of these are generally regarded as ornamental in any sense. Yet where these organs are visible, they become overlaid with a secondary symbolic significance, and their redundancy is usually emphasized by further decoration or anomalous function. If anybody here, I'm so ashamed that I cannot do this, but it's not my fault. If any of you can wiggle your ears, that's thanks to possession of extrinsic ear muscles, which I don't possess and which most of us don't possess. Nevertheless, even where skewmorphs take on an ornamental role, the evidence of original function still remains coded into their form. There is no transfer from one medium to another here, but the shift in function of any organ demarcates a real phylogenic shift and refers to genuine transitions in the intensive relation of a species and its environment. Now, such vestigial organs have often been studied within an evolutionary framework and as often have been misunderstood as the continuing myth that the human embryo develops then transforms into the ears residual gills attests. Those uh, formations which appear in the embryo are merely the brachial arch. Archaeologists write mostly about skewmorphs, however. And the most recent thorough theorization of the concept is to be found in Michael Vickers and David Gill, a book called Artful Crafts, written in 1994. But they are solely concerned with the archaeological framework of its application to Greek ceramic imitations of metal vessels from the 6th to the 4th century BC. Michael Vickers, in his German volume on skeuomorphism, provides a further definition, in addition to the OED's definition of skeuomorphism. He defines it as the migration of a form native to one medium to another. Other archaeologists, such as Richard Bailey, uh, have noted the traces of metalworking elements upon stone Anglo-Saxon crosses such as stone studs. And Bailey suggests that when we look at such uh, stone studs on Anglo-Saxon crosses, what we're looking at is the emulation of the dueling of metal crosses, which use of valuable material served as an appropriate glorification of God, but also as an imitation of the crux gemata, which itself was supposed to be a transfiguration of the true cross. And here is the Lothar which uh, currently rests in Aachen Dom in Germany. Another ar archaeologist, Karl Nappet, has discussed the applications of skeuomorphism to modern photography and film, but only briefly and in one paper. And like many of the writers currently working on skeuomorphism and currently working on the de development of material culture studies from a fledging, fledgling discipline into a mature science of the artificial, Nappet's work is concerned primarily with how we derive meaning from objects and theorizes skewmorphs within a semiotic framework borrowed from C.S. Peirce. In using semiotics to interpret material culture, Nappet, like others, uh, is essentially engaged not in determining forms as non-Cartesian expressions of thought, or in other words, uh, and I'll come to this later, as memes 
as they believe. Rather, as semioticians, they are engaged in an epistemology of attributed meaning and not an ontology of intended meaning. The advantage of looking at skewmorphs, however, is that it circumvents the problem of um, intention entirely. A skewmorphology is concerned not with new interpretations of old forms, but the ways in which forms act as non-human agencies in themselves. Now, more recently, uh, computer software engineers have started to pick up on the concept of skewmorphism. And as Morch, although he misunderstands the concept, uh, the etymology of the concept entirely, he thinks that the word uh, comes from skewed. Um, he uses skewmorphism to describe the junk surplus functions or the remnants of once functional machine language left behind in bloatware. His prime example is Microsoft Word. Vastly overinflated software in common usage, where each successive generation of the product fails to eliminate the previous version's redundant functions. If you use any Microsoft product at all, you'll be familiar with this. Um, and even if you've heard of Microsoft, you've heard of Windows. The very idea of Windows itself is skeuomorphic in essence. If you've never heard of Microsoft and you use Apple products, then perhaps you've noticed if you've got an iPad that when you use its e-reader, you get a graphical simulation of a physical page being turned. Generally, skewmorphism has, since its coinage, become largely restricted to usage within archaeology. But it's instructive to note that its earliest adherents place it within a much wider morphological system. Alfred Haddon, writing in 1895 in a book called Evolution in Art, sees it as only one type of morphism in an entire classificatory system of form in mainly what he called savage artworks. Most of his terms derive from the object of representation, hence zoomorph, phylomorph, anthropomorph, and so on. Yet the addition of a skewmorph permits Haddon to identify a type of form by the process of its genesis, so that he is able to account for a non-human agency determining certain forms. A further refinement of his system is that it can account for hybrid forms, or what he calls heteromorphs, where a non-intentional skewmorphism is combined with an intentional biomorphism. I am reminded here of uh, the sadly now dead uh, Alexander Chislenko, who spoke at Virtual Futures in 19, uh, 1995 and proposed a concept of infomorphs, information beings which were virtual cyborgs. And it starts to become clear that this is a train of thinking which has been going on for some time. Indeed, uh, recently I've started to think that the ways in which we conceptualize and envisage cyborgs themselves for the past 15 years has been itself skewmorphic. Haddon memorably formulated the meaning of skewmorphism as the annihilation of the useful by the beautiful. That suggests to me that what is needed to resolve the concept is the very opposite of our most recent academic trend. We need an account of the relation between form and function which focuses not on meaning, but on morphogenesis. At this stage, the question of the validity of the biological analogy, which I'm clearly using, ought to come into question. Uh, Philip Stedman, in his book, The Evolution of Designs, makes a careful distinction between Darwinian natural selection and Lamarckian cultural evolution, suggesting that it requires reassessment, as even in the year that book was published, evidence of reticulate evolution in biology was, was becoming available. It's worthwhile considering the extent to which a skew morphology would obey the evolutionary principle that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, 
or, in other words, the principle that each organism develops in stages which follow the same order as the evolutionary stages of the species to which it belongs. In biology, examples of this uh, the idea that uh, the principle that um, the vert vertebrate mammal embryos develop the backbone first. In human embryos, the cerebrum develops last. It would seem that human biological skeumorphs, such as the coccyx, do obey this principle. It develops into an embryonic tail at the same stage as it does in primate embryos, and only later in embryogenesis does it recede to become the coccyx. Now, up to this point, I've been discussing the principle that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, and the question of whether or not we can speak of man-made artifacts in terms of evolution, only in terms of morphogenesis at the ontogenic level. But George Bassella, in the book I mentioned earlier, The Evolution of Technology, describes the great interlocking cycle of invention, replication, and discard that is characteristic of technological selection at the highest level. And this is, in fact, a phylogenic level. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny here. Or the same process applies at the macro and the micro levels, at the molar and the molecular levels, to use the Deleuzean terms which we would have been using in 1995. The relations between invention, replication, and discard are internalized and productive. And furthermore, they seem to apply across distinct fields to the evolution of biological and mechanical entities equally. Perhaps a more familiar, familiar framework for thinking about skewmorphs is Dawkins' theory of memes. Skewmorphs could be categorized within Dawkins' framework. They could be categorized, in fact, as physical instantiations of memes. And as Morch, the software engineer whom I disparaged um, a few moments ago for his poor understanding of etymology, um, summarizes Dawkins' uh, view in uh, really very clear terms in this article, Evolutionary Growth in User Tailorable Systems. And I'll read it out. Memes are the ideas embedded in cultural artifacts, from books to pottery. They have a code that can be reused, that is, described by a language, expressed, that is, presented as readable sentences, and accessible to bodies in their environment, for example, human readers. In the same way a gene can replicate to form new cells, a meme can become part of new artifacts. An example of this is when an idea that has been introduced in a book is found again later in another book. This can be explained as the meme's capability for replication and survival. Memes combine and accumulate in a similar way to how genes combine and accumulate by reproduction and inheritance. Now, I'm not too sure about Mulch's ideas about ideas in books, but the rest of this makes very clear sense to me. And if you'll forgive me a, a, a rather poor pun, I'll move from genes to genes. A concrete example. Some of you may be wearing Levi's. You'll note that they have a small pocket inside the inner right-hand pocket. The pocket's corners are fastened to the body of the jeans by rivets. If you examine, um, and uh, I'm wear, I, I, I fucked up. I'm wearing diesel, man. Um, if you examine on Levi's at least the top button then you'll note that that's also formed in the same stylized form as the rivets that attach the pockets. What we've got here is a series of obsolete functions. After all, the small pocket is uh, now entirely ornamental because we no longer, or at least I no longer, uh, and never did, carry around gold nuggets with me and stylized imitations of functions. This button does rivet, but its function hardly needs to resemble one. 
What then are the characteristic attributes of skewmorts? And how might, be, how might we be able to describe and understand literature, uh, culture, technology, through a skew morphology? I'll place the definitions in front of you again, but I will summarize them by summarizing what seem to me to be the characteristic attributes of skewmorphs. I would say that they seem to be their essential vestigiality, their ornamental form, which is the residue of an obsolete function, and their capacity for replication, or indeed for self-replication. If this logic may be applied equally well to the evolution of the non-organic and the organic, then we must cease to make absolute distinctions between invention and discovery, because everything novel has its antecedent. For example, in poetry, end rhyme, that is rhyme that occurs at the end of lines, has long since lost its primary function of helping the reciter of the poem to remember what comes next in the order of the poem. Why? Because we have writing. We no longer have solely oral poetry. With writing came a major shift, a major technological shift, and end rhyme is now a skewmorph, an artifact which has lost its function and become ornamental, become a design feature. Despite this essential vestigiality, it possesses a remarkable capacity for self-replication and survival. It's evident that a similar principle occurs at a lower level of language, as linguists and etymologists know well. If you speak French, you'll know that uh, je ne sais pas means I do not know. The negatory element is the ne, derived from Latin. Pa, at the end of the sentence, actually means step. I not know step. And it serves merely as an emphasizing element, linguistically, in the same way as the do in I do not know works. It would be perfectly functional for me to say I not know. Yet in modern French, the negatory ne is often dropped nowadays. Je sais pas. So that the originary emphasis word now serves as the vestige of the now absent negation. At a higher level of language, at the linguistic level of dead metaphors, there is clearly some connection between the archaeological usage of skewmorph to mean ornament that is the residuum of function, and, for example, Gregory Bateson's telling comments on terms which refer to mechanical homologies. For example, the word horsepower, where the engine of the car sits at the front of the car, where the horse used to pull in front of the carriage. But one might go even further away from the natural physical world, in the examples I first gave you, away from the biological, away from the linguistic, away from the artificial, and note that even the social is replete with skewmorphs. And there really is no better place to observe the purely ornamental, non-functional traces of once functional rituals or the empty simulations of formal ceremonies than here in England. Here we sit at one of our most conventional of academic rituals, a conference. A very specific conference, in fact. It is a simulation, excuse me, Luke. It is a simulation of an earlier con conference, or rather a series of conferences, each of which simulated its antecedent. What I'm going to do now, I, I'm going to talk very briefly about virtual futures, but I hope you realize that um, I'm also talking about skewmorphs. The object of virtual futures, as it was conceived in 1994 and in 1995 by Joan Broadhurst Dixon, Eric Cassidy, Otto Imken, and myself, 
was to use virtual futures, as I've written in my abstract, as an instrument of ontological clarification. We wanted to understand what entities could be legitim legitimately said to exist in a world which was dematerializing and accelerating at the same time. We wanted to produce a neo-materialism that could account for these non-human agencies, uh, what Gilles Deleuze called abstract machines, which we considered to be driving both artificial and natural production. It's only now, looking backwards, which as I said to you at the beginning is not something I'm particularly fond of doing, that I realized the irony of the failure, as I see it, of the original Virtual Futures project, as I've described it. Because it's only as I've come to be able to describe one of these very non-human agencies, with what I call the skewmorph, that I realized that we were actually subject to this agency ourselves. And that therefore, the evolution of the conferences themselves exemplified the processes they were designed to identify. As Joan Broadhurst Dixon uh, has written to me and to Luke, the Petri dish in which Virtual Futures was cultured was the once Center for Research in Philosophy and Literature here at Warwick, which was by 1994, even before we organized the first conference, already reaching the end of a long-standing battle between uh, internal groups of phenomenologists, formal logicians, Derridaeans, and the new breed of Deleuzeans, who clustered around uh, the infamous Nick Land. All the conferences, from Joan's conference on Deleuze and the Transcendental Unconscious in 1992, through Virtual Futures 94, and Thomas Pynchon's Schizophrenia and Social Control, which was organized by Eric Casty and myself in the same year, up to Virtual Futures 95, were entirely student organized, involving various permutations of the four people I've mentioned, with Nick Land operating as a very hands-off inspiration. But however carnivalesque these events became, their aim had been consistent, I would insist, right from the beginning. Their aim had been to analyze and to explain the non-human agencies of the virtual, from Deleuze's machinic intelligences to the imperceptible mechanisms of this new space, cyberspace. By the end of 1995, this epistemic project, the grounding function, was effectively over, obsolete, dead. The whole generation of mainly graduate students who had provided, and it was, it was a freakish time to be, um, I wasn't even in the philosophy department, I was in the literature department, but I was sucked as if by a tractor beam by this freakish generation that provided a, 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 a once in a century spike in um, the number of distinctions awarded in philosophy in the MA program. Uh, one year, I think it was 1995, there was something like 20 distinctions. The following year, it dropped down to the usual one, two. Uh, many of those people, many of their names you now know. Some of them will be here. So many of these people had left Warwick or were in the process of doing so. Nick Land himself was deeply depressed uh, at his treatment by the university and by the department. He was sleeping in his office on a 36-hour awake, 12-hour sleep cycle, staring at numerological sequences on his green, green screen Amstrad computer and refusing to open the door. The official migration of Sadie Plant, who'd always been a good friend but not necessarily greatly involved in the conferences, from Birmingham University to inaugurate the new C crew what should have been the inheritor of the virtual futures tradition, the cybernetic culture research unit, meant that she brought with her her own graduate students. But as they were moving from a cultural studies department into a philosophy department, the effect was perhaps predictably schismatic. 
This meant that, um, in my view, and Gion's view, and Otto's view, the final virtual futures in 1996, though I enjoyed it greatly, was an ersatz. I think of 1996 now as the Sugar Babes year, the year in which all the original members of the band had left to be replaced by new, perhaps more cosmetically appealing members, continuing under the old name. It was the year of simulation, in which the perpetuation of an aesthetic of apocalyptic futurism overcoded and erased the original function. It was the year of virtual futures, the skewmorph, in fact. And had I only been able to realize this at the time, I might have been satisfied that the project had in fact failed only in order to succeed. So I'll, um, I'll finish there. Thanks.